Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. So yeah, I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about this uh, long walk, this big adventure I had in 1995, um, which really began uh, in one way on a December day in 1994. I was living in Minneapolis and there had been a blizzard and I went to an outdoor store called REI uh, to buy a shovel. I was going to buy a little foldable shovel because I needed to dig my truck out. And I was standing in line waiting to pay for the shovel. Uh, and just to kill time, I glanced at a book on a shelf nearby. And I, and I grabbed it off the shelf. It was a book called The Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. And I'd never heard of the trail. But I turned it over and I read this one little paragraph that described what it was, a trail that went from the Mexican border, uh, where Mexico borders California, all the way up um, a few miles into Canada, along the crest of the Sierra Nevada mountain range and the Cascade Range through California, Oregon, and Washington. And it was one of those moments in my life that, was, that you sort of stop and, and notice because you actually feel. I felt the moment right here. I felt something. Uh, sort of open in me, and something spoke to me. I, I, I felt that this trail I'd never heard of moments before, I recognized right away that it was something that was really grand and magnificent and beautiful and, and significant, and it was essentially everything uh, that was the opposite of what I felt myself to be at that moment in my life. Um, I had really, you know, that, that, that day that I needed to go dig out my truck, it was true that I really needed to dig myself out too. I was, I guess, at this place in my life that I think, you know, very much now I can look back um, and see very clearly that it was like the bottom point of my life. And what had happened about three and a half years before that is my mother had died really suddenly of cancer. She was 45. And we were both seniors in college, and she got what we thought was a cold. And seven weeks later, she was dead of advanced stage lung cancer. And it was one of those things that I, it had never, I was young enough that it had never occurred to me, uh, essentially, that my mother would die. And she was really my only parent. And those of you in the room who have lost somebody who was essential to you, who was really that essential person, know what I mean when I say that, you know, the, the world as I knew it ended the day my mom died. And it was, a, it was a new, it was a different world without her. And so I stumbled forward into that world trying to, um, trying to make it work and also ultimately realizing that, that I couldn't, or, or at least I believed I couldn't. And I spun into essentially a, a self-destructive, kind of grief that was compounded by the fact that I was simply, you know, young. I was in my 20s and I was in the midst of this moment anyway that we all have to uh, experience when we're trying to grow up and trying to figure out who we are. And I couldn't figure out who I was without that person. I didn't have a dad and um, my life really, my family fell apart in the wake of my mom's death. And so I, I did all kinds of things. Uh, I was, you know, wildly promiscuous uh, with men and women and all kinds of people, um, just men and women, um, <laughs> nothing else, nothing else. Um, and uh, I, got, I got involved with heroin, I, I, I met this guy who was uh, sort of becoming a, a junkie and I sort of, you know, started down the path of becoming a junkie too. And I knew that None of these things were the person I really was inside. But I think in some ways I was, you know, proving my love for my mom by refusing to live without her, refusing to thrive. And, you know, now I have two little kids. I have a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old. And I know that, that, you know, the only thing I want for my kids is for them to thrive, no matter what happens. That's what I want for my kids. And I think it was at that moment that I was in that store holding that guidebook when I felt that thing inside of me that I realized that I had failed my mother. I had not only failed myself, I had failed my mother. 
And I couldn't live with that anymore. And I knew I had to figure out a way that I was going to go into the world as the person that she had raised me to be. And so I decided to go for a long walk on this trail. And I was, at the time, I was living in Minneapolis. I was a waitress and a writer, um, which meant I was a waitress. And um, <laughs> so I was writing it every chance I got and, and when I wasn't like having sex and shooting heroin um, and waiting tables. And I, so I would, I would wait tables and save my money and every week I would go to this, back to this store and I would say, you know, I'm gonna take this trip, I'm gonna go by myself, I'm going to hike for about three months, about 100 days, and you know, I need stuff uh, for this trip, and they would happily sell me, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I su shut down my life in Minneapolis. I was married at the time uh, to someone I loved, dismantled that, dismantled everything, and uh, very unoriginally uh, went west, traveled west uh, to find my new life. And I, I went to this um, little town of Mojave, California. And, you know, in the months preceding this, I had to do things like... Um, dehydrate food and prepare these resupply boxes that I would mail myself at different stops along the way. And the stops along this trail are not, you know, towns so much as they are often just like a gas station or a bar or a ranger station. And I addressed these boxes full of things I would need. And I, and I settled everything. And I got myself to the town of Mojave, essentially hitched a ride, and was left in the parking lot of this place called the White's Motel. And all I had was my pack and all the stuff that I'd bought for my trip. And I checked in to the motel and I uh, piled everything onto the bed. And I looked, at, I looked at it all, it was this gigantic pile. And it was really only then, you know, that was that moment, it was day, you know, that was the day one of this long trek I was gonna, going to take. Um, I looked at all this stuff and I realized, uh, you know, that I'd never gone backpacking before. <laughs> which was, I mean, I realized really in a profound way. <laughs> and, you know, I had gone hiking. I was a hiker. And I had, you know, so I, in some ways I had sort of convinced myself that this, this day hiking would prepare me for this, this backpacking. And um, I was really quickly about to learn um, that, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of like, you know, babysitting twins for an afternoon and giving birth to twins. Um, they're not comparable undertakings whatsoever. So, um, you know, I, I packed this pack for the first time and found that all this stuff that I had bought didn't all fit in the pack, and so I had to, you know, lash a lot of things to the outside of the pack. And I also remembered that essentially I had really sort of just begun to hike my um, hike in just a place that I had essentially chosen randomly, uh, the Mojave Desert. And it sounds really cool, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't you want to begin in the Mojave Desert if you were going to walk uh, for three months? And, you know, so, but what, what that meant, it really had great consequence to me on that first day, because it meant that there's, it turns out there's, you know, very little water in the Mojave Desert. And I mean, I'm from Minnesota, which maybe you don't know what that means, but it's like there's a lake, you know, every, you know, 50 feet in, in Minnesota. It's called the land of 10,000 lakes where I come from. And Mojave Desert, not so much. And <laughs> so I had to carry just that first day that I was setting out. I had to lash 24 and a half pounds of water um, onto my pack, which I don't know what that is in stone or whatever, but it's a lot. Um, and what happens, so I get everything and I can't, I, I go to then, it's time to leave, I can't delay anymore, and I can't uh, lift my pack. And I couldn't even begin to lift it. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was just sort of heavy, it was that it was actually unliftable. Like, I could lift pretty much anything in sight, I think all of you, I couldn't lift that pack. And um, and this was the first problem because, um, you know, I was in an air-conditioned motel room and I was trying to set out for an 1,100-mile hike in the wilderness. Um, and it was really the first moment that, you know, I just thought, okay, well, you know, I have, I have this choice, you know, I could, I could st stop or go forward. And really, stopping before I set out was never an option because I, I came to this moment 
It was like my own personal a crocodile initiation. Um, and I came to this moment that I, that, that the, the one thing I couldn't do was fail. Like I could do, I could fuck up in all kinds of ways, but I could not fail. And so I got this pack attached to me. I sat down on the floor and I, and I, I attached it to me and I did this thing, this embarrassing thing that I won't demonstrate for you because I haven't had enough to drink. Um, but I rocked back and forth essentially and got myself onto my hands and knees and did a dad lift. And I couldn't uh, stand up. Um, I was like this. And um, the pack was horribly, horribly, awfully, you know, I had to cinch it very tightly to my body just so I could walk. And I did. I, I hitched a ride um, 10 miles to where the trail crossed a, a highway, and I began to walk. Or sort of, you know, do the, that, whatever that movement is that I could do underneath that pack. And within, you know, there was this first moment where you're, when you prepare for a trip like that, it's like, okay, here I am. I'm on the Pacific Crest Trail, this thing. And, you know, I'd been planning for months. And I should say that in addition to the planning, I hadn't, um, you know, stopped any of the, the sort of ridiculous things I'd been doing. Um, I do think that I'm the only person who's ever set out on a long distance backpacking trip uh, having shot heroin 48 hours before. Um, but uh, so I prepared, you know, uh, only a little bit for this. And so I'm. <laughs> I'm, so I'm out there, and within about five minutes, I realized that, um, you know, this is hell, and I want off, and there's absolutely no way um, that I can do this. And um, I, nonetheless, you know, just kept going. I was terrified. I was in, you know, the, these desert mountains with every, everything around me. It was sharp and, and jagged, and every, all the wind was rattling, everything was brittle and, and sounded like a rattlesnake to me. And sometimes it actually was a rattlesnake. And I, in that first week, um, for the first eight days of my trek, I didn't see another human being. And so I was, I wanted to be alone on my hike, but I didn't know I would be that alone. And it was really too this, you know, I, I had put the wrong kind of gas in my stove, and so I couldn't uh, cook any of the dehydrated food that I was carrying. I had um, really underestimated my ability to, to, to move forward quickly and was way behind schedule in instantly. And also everywhere that my pack was making contact with my body, um, it just had rubbed my skin uh, clean off. And so I was just, you know, literally bleeding from, from my shoulders and my hips and my, my, my feet were killing me. And in the midst of this, um, Underneath all of this, I was feeling, uh, I should, is there the picture of me with, this is me in like the first week or two of my trek. It's actual dirt on my face, I think. But um, I, I was feeling that, uh, that there was something, nonetheless, some, some really huge, something really huge and beautiful beneath the agony. And, and I think that that's what was driving me forward. Um, one day, about day seven or eight of my hike, um, again, having not encountered any humans, um, I looked up and there was this, this large, um, horned, hairy, brown beast um, coming at me down the trail. And the trail was this narrow uh, place where there was no escape. It was on a, a steep slope. And uh, it was running toward me, and, and there was nowhere for me to go but to scramble up into these really sharp manzanita bushes to get away from it. And in the split second that I was completely flipping out because I was about to, to die, um, I couldn't, I knew it was this large brown beast, and I couldn't identify. I, I just started, I'm from Minnesota, so I just started screaming, moose, moose, you know, um, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. But it was a Texas longhorn bull. Um, that had gone feral and um, wanted me out of the way. And in my terror of getting away from it, I ran up into the, the, these bushes and, and closed my eyes. And I did not, I, I just carried a, a whistle with me and I blew my whistle and um, it disappeared. And I realized that I didn't know um, which direction this bull had gone. Had it gone, uh, was it behind me, you know, in the place that I had passed or was it ahead of me? And it, I think so much of what would come to happen in the course of the 94 days that I did end up walking and I did, and I did end up getting myself to the place I wanted to go um, was that I 
really so much in that first week, uh, what was presented to me was what would be presented to me over and over and over and over again through the course of that journey. Um, and that is um, that I would never know, you know, which direction that bull was in. And in some ways it was always behind me and it was always ahead of me. Um, that thing that I feared. And, and there would, that pack, no matter what I did to it, that, that thing, that weight I couldn't bear, um, it would always be something I'd have to bear anyway. And I think that so much of what I'd gone out there seeking, you know, that uh, seeking to heal my heart and to seeking to heal my loss, um, happened really through the experience of the body, the experience of having to suffer um, and having to endure and having to move forward even though I couldn't. And I think that that's um, where I'll leave you. Thanks.